I recently had the opportunity to attend a concert at the American Heritage School in American Fork, Utah. As we were leaving, my brother-in-law, who is a huge music guy, said it was one of the most impressive concerts he has ever attended, and I think many of us echoed his feeling. But it wasn't just the music that blew us away. It was the light in the kids' eyes as they performed inspiring music of faith. American Heritage School is opening a new Salt Lake City campus downtown this fall. It neighbors the Conference Center and Temple Square. Generous scholarship opportunities are available, and if you've ever been interested in checking the school out, weekly virtual open houses are being held each Thursday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. To explore how the school partners with parents in helping your children learn by study and also by faith, check out slc.americanheritageschool.org for more details and to apply. Again, that's slc.americanheritageschool.org. When he was writing his new book, Divine Patterns, Roger Connors kept thinking of the people in his life that felt God had let them down, that God wasn't keeping his promises. Roger is convinced that God does keep his promises, but that we must know how to obtain God's blessings. As he explains, understanding how God grants blessings when and where is vital. Roger's goal was to help readers keep pushing forward with patience and hope until the day that even the seemingly withheld blessings will all be fulfilled. Roger Connors is a four-time New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author with over 35 years of expertise in organizational culture. He has co-authored many books, including The Oz Principle, Change the Culture, and Change the Game. He is a graduate faculty professional member of Utah Valley University, an adjunct for their MBA program. A convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Roger and his wife Gwen previously presided over the Washington Kennewick Mission. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Pearson, and I am honored to have Roger Connors on the line with me today. Roger, welcome. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Well, I absolutely love reading your book and... I feel like I learned so many things that we, it may feel like we're going a little rapid fire today. But I wondered if you could start us off. You have written multiple best selling, more business type books. So tell us a little bit about your professional career and what led you now to write a book that is religious in nature and about divine patterns. You bet. So I was, I've been a leadership coach and an organizational transformational change uh, consultant. And uh, involved in the study and practice of human performance, working mostly in Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 companies all around the world for about three and a half decades. And my, my books of work have been about enabling people to discover their ability to overcome obstacles and achieve results they're seeking, both individually and in teams. So now I get to address that in the spiritual realm, which is fantastic. My leadership books evolve around developing mental models about how to most effectively deal with circumstances you encounter and be successful. And the scriptures are filled with those models or patterns that help us to be effective in assess, accessing God's power to help us solve problems and be happy. So I think it's interesting how... There are several people, I think, that are members of our church, past and present, who have been able to take basically gospel principles and you kind of filter out the gospel part of it, right? And have what what remains is more secular. And there's an example that I thought was really fascinating in your book. You mentioned, you said, throughout my professional career, I have written about the power of personal accountability. The main idea is simple. At the heart of the message lies this one simple truth. You can't let your circumstances define who you are and what you do. That kind of thinking only brings a sense of victimization that paralyzes your ability to think clearly, creatively, 
effectively and quickly. Instead, you have to take accountability in order to take charge of shaping your circumstances. Do this and good things, positive things, game-changing things will begin to happen. Easy to say, but maybe harder to do. And then you say in this book, now in a more spiritual context, I can add this important truth. When you combine all of your efforts with God's grace and power, there isn't any circumstance that you can't face and eventually come off conqueror. And I want to I want to come back to this idea later, but I think this is interesting because you are able now to bring in these spiritual components that you haven't been able to talk about before. Has that been kind of liberating? Oh, for sure. Without question. In fact, anytime I would be teaching those principles and ideas to a leadership team, there's always a temptation to say, but there is something else. (laughs) (laughs) And now I have the opportunity to talk about something else. So that's great. That's so cool. I love that. And you are a convert to the church. Is that right? That's right. How did you come in contact with the church? So I was a pretty uh, curious young man. I was thinking about uh, life and where we came from, why we're here, where we're going, you know, had all those natural questions. And I remember walking down a hill, this hill, a pause road in Southern California with a friend I played football with on, you know, just street football. And I was, I was telling him about a book I was reading. It was called Chariots of the Gods. It was a New York Times bestseller about ancient astronauts visiting the Earth. You know, and I'm inquiring about all this. I'm like, this sounded pretty plausible. And he says, well, I know where we came from. And I looked over at him and I thought, you? <laughs> There's no way you would know that. And then he started sharing with me the plan of salvation. And it blew my mind. I immediately knew what he was telling me was true. And I was, I was just dumbfounded. This friend had this knowledge and that's, that's what kicked it all off. That is so cool. What a great story. I also, I, I remember even as a member of the church, when I was in probably fifth grade, we had a guy take the missionary lessons at our house and the missionaries had, you know, the flip charts and explain the plan of salvation. And that night I just laid awake in bed, like wide eyed because the plan of salvation blew my mind so much. So I feel like I can relate a little bit to that feeling. In the book, Divine Patterns, you write this, God is not fickle when it comes to fulfilling promises. Rather, he is strategic, detailed, intentional, logical in the context of an all-knowing mind, planned and generous. Everything he does is perfect. How has knowing this, that that we worship a God who is perfect, but also all of those other things I think are really interesting, strategic, detailed, intentional. How does that knowledge bring comfort and peace to your life? I, th- I think it, it just tells us that you can count on him. You can be confident that God has a plan and that he'll bring it about in our lives. And you have to understand the nature of God to really have that confidence that he's, you know, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent you know, all powerful, all knowing, always present. In fact, in the book of Abraham, it tells us that Jesus Christ is more intelligent than anyone or anything. And there are some who interpret that scripture as being that he is more intelligent than all the collective human intelligences combined. I mean, that's who we're relying on. That That's who created the plan. I'm like, boy, if you want to get a good plan, that's the person I want to go to to say, hey, could you make a plan for me? That's That's a great way to go. And I recently attended a, a, a physics lecture from uh, Professor Brian Cox. He's a pretty popular uh, lecturer on the topic. And he said that there were 20 billion potential Earth planets in our galaxy alone. 20 billion. And then he said there's 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. And then he went on to say that there, now scientists are speculating that there's an infinite number of what they call bubble universes. I mean, that's a lot of intelligences, right? So For sure. My, my view on this is that uh, you can count on him anytime, anywhere. In fact, I remember as a young man coming back home as a convert for my mission, I came back home to my, my house in Southern California and didn't really have a lot of friends. I didn't have a big network. I've only been a member of the church a year before I left. And my bishop finally turned to me one day and he said, you should go to BYU. And I had applied. I'd gotten accepted for night school, and I, but I had decided not to go. And for some reason, when he said that, it triggered me. And I thought, okay, he's right. I should do this. And so I offered a prayer to Heavenly Father. And I said, I'm going to need your help because I know no one up there. School starts in a week. I have no place to stay. I loaded up my little opal and 
had to uh, tape the plastic in the window because my window was broken and the gum wrapper held up my rear view mirror. And I had to collect $20 in my pocket and went up to BYU. And I remember pulling in on Center Street and where Center Street hits 900 East and sitting there it was about seven o'clock at night, finally got into Utah thinking to myself, okay, now what? Like I have no place to stay. I have no idea where I'm going. And I looked over to the corner across from me and I saw this little apartment complex and I had this strong impression go there. So I pull into this apartment complex and I go knock on the manager's door and she finally answers and asks what I wanted. And I explained what was going on. And she's like, you know, school starts in a week. I said, yeah, I'm aware of that. And uh, she said, I have one bed left in the apartment complex. If you go down and meet the roommates and they say you can stay there, then I'm going to let you do it. I said, okay. And so I, I was, I was walking down to, to go knock on the door. I'm starting to think roommates <laughs> wonder what that's going to be like. So I knocked on the door and when the door opened, standing in the threshold were three former missionaries from the Georgia Atlanta mission where I served that I served with. And they started laughing and said, elder Cotter. And so I, you know, elder Duffman and, and the others. And they said, what do you need? And I said, I need a place to stay. And so that night the Lord took me from, Southern California, 700 miles to one apartment complex, to one door and one bed. And uh, I'll be forever grateful to know that he is a deliverer and you can count on. That's such a good story. That kind of gives me chills a little bit. Thank you for sharing that. Can you give listeners an idea of what you mean when you say divine patterns? And and I, I think you did such a great job in the book of showing just how expansive this idea of observing the patterns of the Lord. Um, but give us a little bit of an idea of when we say divine patterns, what we're talking about. You know, it's not, it's not really something super new. It's just kind of understanding that uh, in the scriptures, the Lord shows us models for us how we can obtain the blessings of heaven. So for example, one pattern is faith precedes the miracle. You know, that's a pattern. We demonstrate faith and the miracles happen in our lives. And every time you study the scriptures, you're, there's a 90% chance that when you do your scripture study today, you're going to discover a pattern. And I think in Come Follow Me, we were, we've been in uh, Samuel recently. I was reading about the Lord chastening Eli, the father of the prophet Samuel through a man of God. And that man of God taught him, he said, for, for them that honor me, I will honor. That's a pattern. Interesting. When we honor God, he will honor us. And so those patterns emerge everywhere in the scriptures. Absolutely. And I, I think as we talk together today, I think people will get more and more of an idea of, of, just what we're talking about. But I love the way you say, just like faith and trust, patience is not just a virtue. It's also a choice. Per the dictionary, it is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. In psychology, patience is studied as a decision-making problem involving the choice of either a reward in the short term versus a more valuable reward in the long term. Lately, I have spoken to several youth groups and I found myself talking about how the church gives us choices. People sometimes say, well, you know, the church just tells you what to do. And I'm like, actually, that's not true. The church tells us we have agency and we have the ability to choose and we actually have tons of choices. So I wondered, how would you say that that understanding this definition of patience as a choice can be helpful? You know, patience becomes important usually when things go wrong, right? Or we're not making progress. That's when patience is required. It's human nature to feel like a victim when bad or difficult things are happening to you, or you're not getting the things that you want to accomplish. And I've written a lot about that in the business world context. You mentioned that earlier when we started the, the podcast. The, the idea that, that I like to think about is that there's this imaginary line that separates this feeling of victimization from feeling accountable or uh, at, at will. The scriptures talk about it, acting or, not, or being acted upon. You know, when we act, that's above the line. When we're acted upon, that's below the line. Above the line, you're feeling powerful. Or below the line, you're feeling powerless. And it's a natural thing for us to, to feel that way. And so it's a choice 
to, to move above that line and to feel accountable for the things that you're doing and powerful enough to go accomplish them. And I think that's where patience comes in. You know, we make a choice to, to do something about our circumstances. And that's what allows us to feel like we can be patient. And so from my perspective, a lot of the things we, we deal with are, are really a matter of choice. One example, there was a, a, a man who had a wife who needed a kidney. And this was an article on a story that was done several years ago in the news. And uh, she was old enough where she was really low on the list of potential recipients of a donor. And so he wanted to do something about it. Most people just kind of feel stuck and uh, feel like there's nothing left to do. So what he did is he made a sandwich board, like a billboard that would hang on, on his, in front of him and behind him, put it over his head. And it had everything on it. Wife needs kidney. Could you please call this number? And he walked up and down the highway in his local city. The news article said he got a hundred people who called the number and volunteered to offer their kidney. There was one that, that was tested that would work and actually was able to donate their kidney and, and save his wife's life. It wow. took him a year to do that. So, you know, I think, I think when we, we hit challenging circumstances, a lot of what goes on is we have to make a choice on how we're going to respond to that. And that it is a choice to do something more. And I often ask the question, you know, what else can I do to try to accomplish this? And this is, this isn't Jacob. The scripture is what more can I do in the vineyard? You know, the Lord comes to the vineyard and the servant in the vineyard says, what more can I do? And he asked that question three times. So I think that's a really great question to ask. Absolutely. I, Along those same lines, I love the story that you tell in the book about a missionary who was able to get in shape to serve a mission after a ton of work. And you said this, now there may be those who would ask just how is the Lord responsible for doing any of this? After all, it was Ross who put in the effort. Ross made smart decisions about what he ate. Ross rode his bike every day. It was Ross who did the work to slay the monster. Why or how does the Lord get credit? Certainly we see people who have no faith in God do similar incredible acts. They don't rely on God only on themselves. How can anyone really know it's God's doing. The touching thing is, if you asked Ross, it was all the Lord. No doubt. It was through God that Ross found the strength to do something he had never done before, to do the near impossible. And this is something I'm, I'm maybe being a little bit selfish here, Roger, because this is something that I've had several conversations with different people in my life about recently of how do we balance seeking the Lord's help, submitting to his will while also putting in the effort ourselves. And how do we, you know, recognize, well, how much effort do I need to put in? Where does that just having submitted my will, where does that come in? So I wondered if you could tell me your thoughts on that. My view on this, and I've tried to have it be informed by what the brethren have taught, but we'll see, right? So my, my view on this is that your effort makes all the difference and your effort makes no difference. Both, both are true. Mm -hmm. And that's the nuance that's really hard to, to grasp. The good news of the gospel is that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, we don't have to wait to the end for God to step in. We're, we don't believe in a God of your gaps, God, meaning... He only steps in at the end after you've done all you could do. But through the grace of God, he is active and involved all the way through the process. It may not feel that way sometimes. We may not recognize it. But the promise isn't that, you know, we do everything we can and then, and then he figures the rest out. He's working with us all the way. Elder Renlund talks about the activating effort that starts the process of, of obtaining the blessings from heaven. We don't earn our blessings, and he's very clear about that. But we do things to begin the process that authorizes God to act. By, our, by exercising our agency, we give God permission to enter into our lives and to start working with us and helping us. He's not waiting for us to finish all our tasks. He may be helping us complete those tasks so that he can help it at the end when we finish. But I do believe that... I, I think I learned this not as a member of the church, uh, but has carried this with me. And this is little, this little phrase, when you're on your knees, pray as though everything depended upon God. And when you're off your knees, 
work as though everything depended upon yourself. You can't go wrong with that formula. Right. But I do think at the end of the day, you know, for example, with Ross, you know, Ross, the miracle wasn't that Ross finally was able to, to get where he needed to be health wise and was approved to go on a mission. The miracle was that Ross had the motivation every day to get out there and to be riding this bike and tackling the monster and staying with it. That, that was, he was being helped all along the way. And then the miracle happened that he, he got out and was an amazing missionary. So I think our father in heaven is with us throughout this entire process, but does need us to do something to get the ball rolling. That's profound. Thank you very much. I wanted to touch on a few things. Like I said, a little bit rapid fire. You quote Elder Hales, who said, spiritually mature obedience is the Savior's obedience. It is motivated by true love for Heavenly Father and His Son. How would you say, Roger, that understanding, observing, and taking part in these divine patterns can help us develop spiritual maturity? Well, there's a lot of ways to obey. We can reluctantly obey. We can obey pharisaically and lose the spirit of what we're doing. I mean, there, obeying obedience is nuanced a little bit. And I think what the way uh, the Lord has defined it, he wants, he wants it all. He wants all of our heart, might, mind, and strength. He wants that kind of obedience in our lives. And when we're able to get to a place where we can, we can think that way and feel that way, uh, amazing things can happen. But you know, that spiritual maturity and way of operating doesn't come until we've been tried and tested and we've fallen down and gotten hurt. I know, I know lots of people who feel like God isn't listening anymore, that he's not answering my prayers, that he has favorites, that other, some people seem to be blessed more than me. And they verbalize that to me. And that's a, that's a hard position to be in because to feel like God has stopped listening, stopped working for us is a difficult, difficult place. And in fact, when I wrote this book, I had in mind a lot of those folks who were feeling like the Lord has let them down, that the plan didn't work. The plan A didn't come through, that the promises didn't actually happen the way that they were, they were told they would happen. And my hope is that uh, the book helps a bit to help explain why maybe that's happening in your life and that you can't trust him and that he will come through and that he will help you with all the things that you desire. You can have faith and trust in him. He's not finished with you. He's just starting. And uh, that's my hope is that, that people will feel that. No, well, I think that's such a cool motivation and a great reason to put the time and effort into a book and writing a book is not an easy thing. So um, even when you've done it a bunch of times, like you have, you have a couple of really great one-liners in the book and there are things that you you say, you know, one of them, I shared this with missionaries a lot or I, I've been known to say this. So I wanted to touch on a few of these. First, whatever the Lord wants, the Lord gets. What does that mean to you, Roger? So uh, our family scripture growing up was First Nephi 3.7. We used to ask our children, what does that mean? And they were we had this, this family response. It means if, if I'm asked to move a mountain, I can move a mountain. And the kids would say that, you know, we probably said that a thousand times as the children were growing up. And that really bottom line is, is the promise that the Lord will move mountains in our lives. If it's needed, he'll, he'll do it. And so it's relying on that. It's, it's really believing that he will come through and accomplish the things that we need accomplished. Okay. Another one of these that I really loved is you, and this is the one that you said that you shared with missionaries. You said you can get what you want or you can have something better. And I love this because I, I'm a big fan of the, the quote by Ezra Taft Benson, where he says, those who turn their lives over to God will find that, that he can do a lot more with their lives than they can. But tell me why this was so important. And, and especially when you're sharing it as a mission president with missionaries, why is that an important message for people at that stage in life to receive? Well, could there be anything more true? I mean, uh, we don't always really know what's best for us, but, but God does. Um, I, I really experienced this when I was graduating from MBA school. My plan was to go work with Bain. I don't know if you're familiar with the mm -hmm. company Bain, a strategic consulting firm. 
and it was a, a top school, top company, and they only came once in a while to BYU and only talked to a couple people. So it was it was a high aspiration to to want to work with them. So finally, that time came, and I was actually one of the two chosen to interview with them. So I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And I did seven interviews in San Francisco and did seven interviews in Boston. And the last interview, basically, they said, we don't think you're a fit. <laughs> and so I came back uh, to the MBA school really discouraged. I'm like, that was my plan A, B, C, and D. And then uh, I looked on the wall in the mailroom and they had this little flyer. And it was about a small consulting firm called Sindelini Leadership Consulting Group that was coming to do interviews. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll try that. There were like only seven people in the company. I mean, Bain was this amazing worldwide thing. And this, these guys are this little niche consulting firm with seven people. So I interviewed with them and they hired me. And it, it catapulted me and launched me into a career that has been amazing, wonderful, tremendous. I've loved it. I, I, there were times I couldn't wait for the weekend to end, except for Sunday when I was doing my Sunday stuff. I couldn't wait for the weekend to end so I could get back to work. I just loved it. And uh, who would have known? I, I wouldn't have known, but the Lord knew. And uh, you can trust him. He's got the best plans for us. And when things don't work out, when a door closes, we can just know if we're walking the covenant path, our Father in heaven will open another door that will take us to the place he wants us to be. I believe in that with all my heart. So I'm so, so grateful that you shared that one more, and this is a little bit more of a quote than a one liner, but this stood out to me as I read, you said, sometimes the manifestation of the miracle is an immediate, but develops over time, not becoming obvious until we put the entire picture together. How have you seen that to be true in your life? Obviously the example you just gave is one, but are there other examples of how you've seen that? Oh my goodness. Uh, those I've, I've come to believe that there's no such thing as coincidences or, or I believe if there's two or three coincidences, coincidences in a row, a miracle is about to be performed. Right? So I remember as a young missionary, we, we were went to his own conference and the mission president, he, he stood up at his own conference and said, reminded us that we should be paying fast offerings. And my companion and I looked at each other and we, we, we thought we should be paying fast offerings. And so we went back to our apartment and we thought, okay, we sat down at our little kitchen table. I can still see it, it was a little, little kitchen table. And we each had $5, $5 for one, the last week of the month. And this was back in the day when you kind of financed your own, your own mission. Right. And we thought, okay, well, let's do it. And so we took our $5 bill, we put it in an envelope, wrote fast offering on it, put it in the middle of the table and said, we have no idea how we're going to get through this next week. Literally within two minutes, the phone rings. It's our ward missionary. He says, I was just thinking about you guys and I want to take you out to dinner. And we looked at each other and we thought, oh my goodness, we knew what to say. Let's go to the Sizzler to the all you can eat shrimp dinner. So we'll eat shrimp and we'll eat as much as we can to last us the rest of the week. So he takes us out to dinner. And on the way home, we haven't told him anything about what's going on. On the way home, he says, can I stop at the store for a minute? I need to get some. I said, sure. And he says, you guys wait in the car. So we're sitting in the car waiting. And as he comes back to the car, we look out the window and there's a clerk with him pushing a, a dolly with uh, five cases of canned food. And so he comes and he puts the canned food in the car and we, we helped him load it in. We said, is this your food storage? He said, no, it's your food storage. I bought this for you. So two hours later, we're sitting back at the same kitchen table where we were sitting with the $5 and we'd had a all you could eat shrimp dinner and had five cases of canned food sitting in the corner. And we thought to ourselves, Oh, how glorious is the Lord in helping us when we obey. Such, such a cool experience. And also it's cool because when you're talking about it, I can recall I, and I think that's the neat thing about experiences. And one reason I love interviewing people for the show is I think when somebody is sharing their spiritual experiences, it helps you recall things that have happened in your own life that are along the same lines. And so hopefully that's happening for others as they're listening to your stories. 
Another story that I loved, and this is this is not one from your own life, but it says one familiar story tells of a boy who wanted to give a gift to his teacher who was returning home to England from a faraway nation. The boy lacked money to buy a gift. The day before the teacher was to leave, the boy brought her a huge seashell. The teacher asked where he had gotten the shell. It was from a bay many miles away. The teacher exclaimed that it was beautiful, that that he shouldn't have gone so far to get her such an exquisite gift. The boy simply said the long walk was part of the gift. And then you said a profound truth. The greater our service, the deeper we will fill. I'm curious for you, Roger, for somebody that has had a successful career, and we've had a number of former mission presidents on the show for various reasons, but I don't think I've ever asked one of them about this. It's a big sacrifice to walk away from success and not knowing exactly how things are going to be three years later. How did you see the truth of this principle that the greater our service, the deeper we will fill in your service as a mission president? Well, that was that was definitely one of the toughest things that I've ever done. And anybody I know who's done it would, would echo the same sentiment, you know, no matter how accomplished they were in their in their career, whatever that might have been. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, an amazingly rewarding assignment, but an amazingly challenging one to be a mission leader. And I knew something was, was going to happen when we went to the mission president seminar and they fed us so much. I've learned that when they start fattening the calf, there's going to be a sacrifice. <laughs> and, and that was indeed what we experienced, but it was amazing. We used to, I remember we used to gather as mission presidents at mission president seminar when we weren't in the workshop, but we'd have some time to just chat. We were all standing around one time in the hallway talking about how we handled our stress. And one of the mission presidents looked at me and he said, well, what I do when I pull into the driveway at night at 1030, I just sit there for a minute. I have, I have a Big Mac on one hand and a Big Mac on the other hand. And I just sit there and eat my Big Macs. <laughs> and that's how he handled his stress. Double Probably fisting the Big Mac. Double fisting the Big Macs. Not the most effective way I'm sure to do it, but... You know, it's interesting. There's all sorts of missionaries with everyone has a different background, different family support, different personal, physical, and mental health challenges. No two missions are the same. And missionaries should compare themselves to one another or their missions because it's a unique experience. We all come with just such varied backgrounds and personal challenges. And for myself, for example, I came home two months early on a medical release as a mission president. So I was into the mission almost three years and was diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer and had to leave the mission early. So I I had a medical release as a mission president. I just hope every missionary who, who went out, if they came home early, if they had a COVID mission, which changed things up dramatically, whatever might have happened, your mission is unique to you. And it's and that's how the Lord intended it. However long it was, or whatever you experience, that was your unique experience. And there's, it's, it's what the Lord would have had happened for you. And uh, I believe with all my heart that if everyone did their best and uh, strove to accomplish what the Lord asked, whatever, whatever offering we made is acceptable to him and he's happy with it. I love that. I I think that you are spot on. The beginning of COVID, Deseret Book released some videos and Laurel Day, the president of Deseret Book, did a video where she was talking to these COVID missionaries. And she highlighted the part in the mission call where it says it is anticipated that you will serve this many months. And she said, you know, that means that sometimes things don't go as anticipated. And I thought that that was profound. And I love that you highlighted that and and that you can empathize with those whose missions get cut short for whatever reason. Because I have friends who had to come home on, on medical releases and it's something that sticks with you long term. Yeah, I have... I In my uh, Provo assignment, I interview... Uh, young single adults all the time who are describing their COVID missions. You know, they, they were called to Buenos Aires and they had to route to Texas and then, or maybe they went to Buenos Aires for three months and came home for three months. Then they went out to Texas for seven months and they went back to Buenos Aires to finish. Right, Right. And you know, that's hard. I mean, when you're the newbie in so many different places, that's challenging. Learning a language in that circumstances is challenging. But the Lord knew all of that. I mean, he wasn't surprised. You were surprised. 
but he wasn't surprised. He, he knew exactly what was going to happen and the way it would happen. And he wanted that unique experience for that person. And I, and, and everyone tells me, I, I ask him, so how was your mission? Oh, it was great. I said, so how was your mission? Oh, it was really challenging, but how did it go for you? I loved it. And I constantly hear these missionaries say it was a fantastic experience, even though it was as challenging as it was pretty, pretty impressive, pretty amazing. Right. Right. I I've been so impressed. We had a handful of missionaries come home to my ward in Salt Lake and every one of them, when they would speak about their mission, I would think that would be so hard, but they were all so positive about it. And I think that's a skill set that will serve them for the rest of their lives. No question. I mean, if you would have called me as a mission president and said, president, we got a new program. We're going to take your missionaries. We're going to lock them up in their apartments for seven months what do you think? <laughs> Terrible idea. I was like, can I get a plane ticket out of here? <laughs> yeah. 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 So hard. Okay. Roger, before we wrap up, I wanted to kind of dig into one of these patterns, if it's okay with you. And it is that of uh, the role of a broken heart and a contrite spirit in repentance. So you start out and you kind of break down both a broken heart and then a contrite spirit. When you're talking about a broken heart, you compared it to a romantic relationship. And I thought this was so good. So I wondered if you could share that with listeners. Yeah, you know, I think uh, one way to think about that is who who hasn't had a broken heart in a romantic situation? Everybody and, can yeah, relate to that. Right. You feel the pangs of lost love and whatever rejection or whatever it might have been. And for many, for many of us, that was not just an emotional feeling. It was a physical feeling. I mean, it was, it was pretty comprehensive. And I think what, when, when our father in heaven talks about that, that's the sacrifice he's looking for when it comes to, to sin, you know, intentionally disobeying the laws of God, that when we do that, that we, we feel that sense of sorrow, that something's missing, something's been taken away. And that causes us to want to come back to him, to be made whole. I'm grateful for the moments I felt the broken heart and contrite spirit because it's, it's caused me to be better at what I do and, and what I'm trying to accomplish in terms of becoming like the Father. If we're walking the covenant path, the promise is that we'll have never-ending happiness and we will be blessed to have all things that are before us. I, Heavenly Father, he rejoices in our strengths and tech talents. He delights in our creations and achievements and our service. He celebrates our expressions of love and selflessness. He revels in our being agents unto ourselves. He, he loves us and is so excited for us when we're on the path doing the things that he wants, but he's saddened, heartbroken when we sin and we disregard the laws of God, which are boundaries that he's helped to set for us so that we can be kind, merciful and holy. So I think he really wants us to be ready for thrones, kingdoms, principalities, powers, dominions, exaltation, all heights and depths, maybe even our own bubble universe. I don't know (laughs) however that's going to turn out. And that's his intention is to help us get there. So, and he's told us a broken heart and a contract spirit is the sacrifice we should bring to the sacrament and lay upon the altar so that we can become like him. That's, that's a, that's a small sacrifice to pay for all the blessings that are yet before us. So I would just say, I know, I know he is committed to helping us achieve our, what he has planned for us. He will help us every step of the way. If we feel like he's left us, that it's not working out, that his promises aren't coming to pass. We just need to hang in there and know that if we keep continue to test that, that he will bring about his purposes and plans for us, but it'll be according to his own timing in his own way, in his own, in his, in his own, in his own approach. For sure. And I love, I love when you talk about the contrite spirit and you, you highlight how the Hebrew rendering of that word in the scriptures is defined as crushed or dust. And I think sometimes it can be hard to understand why a loving God would allow us to feel brokenhearted or crushed or why he would even ask that of us. But I think it's, it's profound to think about the fact that, that sometimes it's, that brokenheartedness or feeling crushed that that allows us to turn to him in ways that we might not otherwise. You do offer a warning along with this point that I thought was interesting. 
in that with these patterns, it can be easy sometimes to view things as a checklist. And I think that's, that's human nature. It's, it's really nice for us to have like, okay, this is exactly what I need to do. And you write a a checklist approach to repenting will likely cause someone to miss the whole point. Repentance isn't accomplished by just going through a list of steps you need to take. Rather, it's a process that requires a sincerity of heart that produces a willingness to do whatever God may require to be pronounced clean. Why would you say that it sometimes might be important to to not view these things as a checklist? You know, I remember as a missionary, we were taught the steps to repentance, and they were five or six steps, depending on how you talked about it. And you teach these steps, and the brethren have really shifted that thinking to to get away from steps. It's a process, and you know, really don't think about it that way. Elder Christopherson recently taught in general conference. As you'll, you'll remember this. God is not a cosmic bending machine. Remember that mm-hmm. phrase where we select a desired blessing, insert the required sum for the works, and then it's, the order is promptly delivered. He says something like that. And uh, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, sometimes when we, when we think we've done what we need to and the blessing doesn't come, we're disappointed. It should have worked that way. Why did it work that way? You know, I did this and this, but this and this didn't happen. So God, therefore, has let me down. Right. That's the the risk of thinking of it as a checklist or, or steps that things automatically happen. But I think we have to realize that our Father in Heaven has a plan for us, and He has some timing associated with it, and that things will happen at the right time in the right way according to His will. And if we discover that and believe it and really want that to happen, I remember I, I had some uh, properties in California. I was trying to get them sold and I had some challenges doing it. I had to keep holding on to them. And then it started raining and they were all leaking and it was just, it became a miserable situation. And I'm like, Heavenly Father, when are you going to lift this for me? You know, help me do this. And finally, each one of these had their own purpose. And one, my, my son met his wife while living there. And another one, my daughter actually adopted a child and it came from that location. She had to go and live there for a period of time because of California law. And, you know, once these purposes were fulfilled, the properties were able to, to be sold. And I remember going from praying for these things to happen to praying that heavenly father, whatever you want to have happen here, I'm fine with it. If, if I need to hold these for a long period of time and that's your, that's your will then I will do it. And it caused me to change the way I prayed from my will to thy will. And I really meant it. Like when I said, thy will be done, I meant it with all my heart, whatever you want. I always look back and I'm grateful that I was, I went through a very excruciating kind of a a situation because it taught me to really trust in him and want his will. Yeah. Well, I think it's through having experiences that we start to recognize that we can trust him. I love the scripture in Malachi where it says, prove me now herewith, where it's like, try me, see if this works. If it doesn't work, that's fine. So I think you touch on that and and recognizing that it's through experience that then we say "Thy will be done and we genuinely mean it. But I also, I love, there's one thing that I realized I didn't put in my questions that I really loved from your book. You talked about how your family had been praying for something years earlier and, and that problem was resolved and you and your son were talking about it. And your son said, dad, I still pray about that. And you're like, what? Like, why are you still praying about it? That got resolved. And he was like, I still tell Heavenly Father how grateful I am for His help through that. And I think that that principle of gratitude, when things do, when we do start to see it come together, and when those prayers do start to be answered is just so important. Anything you would say about that, Roger? Well, that that what he was praying about was that situation, those properties. Okay. Everyone was praying about it. And it was a profound thing. And I I remember just learning it. It was, it was just like, I should have, I should have been doing that. You know, you're the one that's thanking him a year later. And so I don't know, it's been a decade since all that situation occurred, but my wife and I will still often every sometime during the week in our prayers, we will thank him for delivering us from that situation and others. And, uh, it's, it's, it was a great lesson to learn from him. That's awesome. 
Roger, this has been such a great conversation. I feel like I have things that I've learned and will take away and apply. But my last question for you is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, I use two pictures in some of my leadership training when I'm working with leadership teams. And one picture shows a line going down the side of a road where tree branches had fallen. And the person painting the lines on the side of the road in a line painting truck drove around the branch, but you, but the, it continued painting. So you see the straight line and then there's this curve around the branch. It's just hilarious when you look at it. And then I show a picture of a workman with his body half buried in water, head first. And everyone speculates he had fallen in. But the, the real story is that there was a leak in a pipe that was underneath the ground. And the only way he could stop it was to dive into this, this pool of water head first and without seeing anything, feel the pipes and actually turn the water off and get it stopped, which he did. It was successful. Total hero, right? Yeah. And for me, it being all in means not just going through the motions and checking the boxes, like maybe the driver painting, painting the lines did. It means to dive in head first and be a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just when it's convenient and particularly not when it's convenient. If we honor God, he will honor us, especially in our moments of greatest need. I know he'll be there. He will be in it and he will be with us and he will rescue and deliver us. But it will be according to his own way and timing and his own will. When we are all in, he is all in with us. And that divine love will carry us through anything. So well said. Thank you so much, Roger. It's been a delight to talk with you. Thank you so much. It's been great. Big thanks to Roger Connors for joining us on today's episode. You can pre-order Roger's book, Divine Patterns, on DeseretBook.com now. Thanks to Derek Campbell for his help with this episode. And thank you so much, as always, for listening. We'll be with you again next week.